In the name of the Holy Trinity, one God. Amen. The last words my father said to me before he died were, Give him hell, Paul. I understand that this might strike you as odd. My father was a priest after all, and speaking to me in this way, as if I were one of his Marine platoon officers, might sound severe to you, demanding or authoritarian. To me, however, they are words of love, words I cherish. My dad, you see, was not a, a controlling type. He was rarely stern. He gave us the freedom as kids to find ourselves with lots of room for mistakes. I think my friends loved him almost as much as I did. My dad was Father Bill to them, the gregarious priest with a personality as big as the sky and some endearing, but definitely unconventional ways about him. When dad said to me, give him hell, Paul, short for Polly, he was encouraging me to go on, get after it, to be bold in following my call. You see, we had just talked that week, or I should say I had just gotten up enough courage to tell dad that I was gonna go to seminary. That was over 18 years ago. But just the thought of dad comes rushing back to me when I smell Old Spice mixed with stale cigarettes or when I eat an egg sandwich and remember how dad always poured ketchup on his with the ketchup and the yolk of the egg running down onto the plate, making a brown mucky mess on the plate. As clearly as I can see that, I can hear my dad giving me his unorthodox blessing. Give him hell, Paul. Dad served only two obligatory years in the Marines, but even as a priest, dad was a Marine to the day he died. His approach to life embraced two mottos, take that hill and live by faith. If your platoon sergeant says, take that hill, by God, you take it. And if your savior tells you he loves you even until the end of time, by God, you live the life of a beloved. My father was fearless, which is not always to say that he was the best one to follow, as sometimes his fearlessness got us into trouble. I know Rob will remember this story when we were dating. Our parish, this is Holy Comforter in Gadsden, took a parish retreat down to Camp McDowell. We had some great fun down there. Rob came with me. We came up from Auburn and joined our parish. And dad had this wonderful idea. It had been a very rainy spring. Dad loved whitewater rafting. He said, let's take the canoes upriver. Let's put them in the truck, take them up the river and launch them and ride them back to camp. It'll be great fun. Well, for some reason, they gave him permission to do so. Now, these were not rafts. These were canoes and they had no flotation devices in them. They were just aluminum canoes with paddles. But we put on our life vests and we all trekked down to the up the river, put our canoes in. The water was so high that the tree limbs, you had to duck underneath them as we canoed down. Rob and I and my mom were the last to canoe to put in. Mom sat in the middle of the canoe and we were paddling along and Rob being a goofy one, let one of the tree limbs clothesline him and he fell back into the water. He was just having a good time. The water was rushing pretty hard. It took him a little while to get back in the canoe, but eventually we did. But we were so far behind the rest of the group that we didn't see them for a while. And there comes a point when Clear Creek actually makes a turn. It feels like a 90 degree turn and there's this enormous rock. It's probably standing 15, 20 feet above the water. And there were people there screaming at us, turn, turn, paddle, turn. Apparently lots of the people ahead of us did not make that turn and they came out of their canoes or their canoes wrapped around the rock and they were left to swim for shore. We did make the turn feeling pretty proud of ourselves, but then we saw the carnage ahead of us. So many people had fallen out of their canoes. There were people on one side of the river or the other. There was a dear friend of ours, a man named Dr. Dale Smith. He was about 63 years old and I remember watching him hanging on to a branch, just with his chin and nose above the water, desperately waiting for somebody to help him. I couldn't get out of the canoe. 
couldn't figure out how I might help him. There were others stranded in the brambles on one side, screaming and telling us, watch out, be careful. Eventually, our canoe too filled with water. The white water was just too much for these canoes. Rob was yelling at me. I was screaming, we're gonna die. And Rob was saying, Polly, grab the canoe. Come on, we're gonna save it. My mom was screaming at me, Polly, you know how to swim. Get to shore, get to shore. Well, we saved the canoe. We had to. But many of the canoes actually kept going down the river, empty with no persons in them. Now, there was a crew back at camp that decided not to go on this trip. I'm sure they probably knew my dad a little bit better than I. And they were sitting on the back porch of Epps, enjoying themselves, when they looked down at the river and saw some empty canoes go by. And they watched those canoes go by and slam into the dam, fold in half and tumble over. That caused some panic, as you might imagine. People ran over to the chapel and started praying. People started scurrying down the trails to try and find what happened to the people, what was going on. My good friend, Paul Pratt's brother, David, was on the trip with us and he came running through the trails and he actually pulled lots of people out, including Dr. Smith. Several of us made our way to shore. We hitchhiked out to, we hit, we hit, hiked out to the road and hitchhiked back to camp. Little by little, we trailed into camp trying to count numbers. We were very fortunate. Everybody made it through the trip. No one was injured. Even my little brother and a friend who ended up on the other side of the river and thought they'd just hike, ran into brambles. And they thought they'd make it to the swinging bridge, but they couldn't make it. So they found a canoe that had been lodged in the brambles, jumped back in it, no paddle, made it to about the middle of the river until that canoe filled with water. <clears throat> and then they swam to the other side, found their way back to camp. You should have heard the sermon my dad preached the next morning on the evils of the ego and the sin of pride, boasting, self-absorption. Right there in the chapel on the side of Clear Creek, dad preached what they call a hell, fire, and damnation sermon aimed entirely at his own folly. This is the way dad tackled everything, every problem, every challenge, head on and with unwavering faith. When I sat down with today's gospel lesson, I thought of my dad. I'm sure Father's Day had something to do with it, knowing I was preaching this day. But I remember how dad embraced the revelry of passages that we read today. When Jesus says, what I say to you in the dark, tell in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Dad never shied away from preaching the fiery words of Jesus. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And dad believed to the sole of his feet that even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. These disparate sentences, sentences hold such contrasting ideas Yet Matthew saw fit to capture them and put them all together here in his gospel. The dissimilarity in these verses, the way they contrast one another, fueled my father's preaching. And I have to admit that I feel their energy fueling me too, challenging us to think. Jesus begins this teaching using the imagery of masters and slaves, and we cringe to hear these words remembering how the church used these passages and others in the Bible to justify the horrific practice of slavery in this country, the end of which we celebrated this Friday, June 19th, Juneteenth. Tragically, as if the whole practice of legally enslaving humans wasn't bad enough, Juneteenth was well over a year after slavery was outlawed. Let's be clear. Jesus was not referring to modern day slavery. Jesus is teaching his followers, just as the prophets of old had done, that there is only one God, one master, and that is God, whom he called Father, the creator of all things visible and invisible. And this master offered life, not enslavement. This master gave his only son to reconcile us. 
Matthew tells us that Jesus goes on to warn his followers that those who call the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? Here, we just need to learn more about what's going on. We Christians, we may hear, hear the word devil when we hear the word Beelzebul. In my house, we called it Beelzebub or Beelzebub. But this is a Christian interpretation for the Hebrew people. Beelzebul was the name associated with a Philistine god. Again, like the prophets of old and all of scripture, Jesus reminds Israel that there is only one God. Look to no other gods, not those you're jealous of or those that you wonder if they might make you feel safer or happier. We are to be faithful to the one who made us and who aches to redeem this beautifully and wondrous, diverse world of ours. While we won't attempt to exegete every single one of these passages in Matthew's entire string of sayings, we do need to recognize that these need more explanation, exploration too. Like most of ancient literature, none of these can be torn out of the Bible and used apart from the bigger story. All are part of the greatest story ever told, the long and ongoing work of a loving God who continually calls us to love. That's the big story. One of the distinctions of the Anglican way, of which we are, by the way, as Episcopalians, is that we believe we are all theologians. That is, our faith embraces the belief that we best discern scripture in community. We understand the words of the Old and New Testament only when we study together and study with the scholars who've studied this forever. The ancient beliefs, biases, and mythologies of the writers of scripture are foreign to us, but not undiscoverable. We are all theologians. We are all to do theology, which as one scholar puts it, is as simple as this. The task of theology is the linking of our individual story to the biggest story we can imagine. The late great Rachel Held Evans wrote this, if the biggest story we can imagine is about God's loving and redemptive work in the world, our lives will be shaped by that narrative. If the biggest story we can imagine is something else like religious nationalism or follow your bliss or he who dies with the most toys wins, then our lives will be shaped by those narratives instead. We, my friends, call ourselves Christians. So as I see it, we are to choose the first narrative, God's story of redemption. And remember, it's not a story of long ago. God's story is ongoing in each of us. Every morning we wake up, just as Paul in his letter implored the Romans to do, to walk in newness of life. Wake up and remind ourselves that what we took on in our baptismal vows matters. We asked ourselves and answered, do you renounce the evil powers that destroy the creatures of God? I do. Do you put your whole trust in Christ's faith and love? I do, we said. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons? All persons. I will with God's help. Will you strive? And that means work. Will you work for justice and peace? I will with God's help. In other words, we are Christians. We're to take that hill. And every morning we are to wake up, remind ourselves that we are loved, loved to the end of time. In other words, we are to live by faith. So my friends, it's time to get to work. Give them hell. Amen.